just, we want to be great at it. And we talk about other people, you know, my dad's greater than your dad, or my mom's greater than your mom. And, and, and so we got all these things, these, these ideas, these aspirations that we're going to be the greatest whatever that the world has ever seen. Problem is we become adults and we realize we're probably not going to be the greatest. Now, there's probably going to be somebody that comes along and they're better than us, but it's okay as a kid. But as an adult, we may realize we're not going to be the greatest at something, but that doesn't mean we don't argue over what or who is the greatest. All right, I started writing down some things that, that I thought, you know what, people, they like this and they like this, and there's an argument about which one is greater. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of these out to you, and I'm going to allow you that after I say them, you just yell out which one to you is the greatest, okay? Some of these are going to be things. Some of these are going to be people, uh, all right? And so you just go ahead and you talk back to me. It's okay to talk in church. So here we go. Uh, talking about the greatest, Ford or Chevy? Apple or PC? PC. iPhone or Android? Android. Google, Google or Siri? Google. PS4 or Xbox? Xbox? Democrat or Republican? Never mind. We'll just, <laughs> just leave that one alone, all right? Mountains or beach? <laughs> Country or rock and roll? Rock and roll. All right. The North or the South? Yeah. We probably should have left that one alone. Sorry if you're visiting from the north or you're here. I'm sorry. Uh, Coke or Pepsi? Chocolate or vanilla? Oh, I hear you, chocolate. Uh, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? Uh, the Cowboys or the Redskins? Michael Jordan or LeBron James? I heard a lot of Jordan. Amen to y'all. Uh, Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson? Babe Ruth or Hank Aaron? Uh, see, there's all these arguments about which is the greatest. And you know what I've found? I've found a lot of it is generational. It depended on when, it, when you grew up. And if you grew up in the era of Michael Jordan, you go, yeah, LeBron's all right, but he don't have six championships. You know, and, and you got things like that. So it'll kind of depend, but it's the whole idea of what or who is the greatest. As we go into this book of Hebrews, that's really what we're going to be talking about for the next several months because we're going to take this journey through Hebrews and we're going to go verse by verse, section by section. And I believe that God is really going to speak to us in this. He's already been speaking to me, and I hope that he's going to speak to you as well. But if you want to grab your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Hebrews. Uh, that's where we're going to be. You've read already the passage that we're going to start with, and, and we're actually going to touch, touch on the entire chapter, but we're going to talk about the first four verses uh, in detail. So one thing that I want you to think about uh, is, is just a little bit about the book of Hebrews. Uh, the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who may have been living in Rome, uh, and it was written in the 60s. I don't mean the 1960s, okay? I mean the original 60s. So the book of Hebrews was written with, within about 30 years or a little more of the time that Jesus was walking this earth. So there would have been people who would have possibly met Jesus or, or would have known people who knew Jesus. And so this is going to be a very, very relevant book. It's written to Christians who are experiencing persecution. That's beginning to happen for them. And, and there's a lot more persecution that's going to be coming just a few years later. But that's who it's written to. Now, the interesting thing about Hebrews is we don't know who wrote it. Okay, now, before your world is rocked at this point and you're like, well, then we, why would we even study it? We study it because it's a part of the Bible. It was accepted as an inerrant, God-spoken part of the Bible. And that's why we study it. Now, a lot of people believe it's Paul. And that would make a lot of sense because he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. So, okay. But when you really start to look at the language and you dig into how Hebrews was written, a lot of people say, uh, especially scholars, well, that doesn't look like the way Paul writes. That doesn't sound the way that Paul sounds. So maybe Paul wrote it. Maybe he didn't. Some people thought it was Barnabas or maybe uh, Apollos or, or, you know, some of these others that could have written it. Origen, who was a, a, a Christian theologian, he said, when it comes to the book of Hebrews and who wrote it, only God knows. And it's okay. All right, I don't want you to get caught up with, well, we, we've got to know who it is like we know who wrote the other books in the New Testament. It's all right. It's still God inspired. God inspired the whole thing. He inspired the book of Hebrews, but for some reason, 
He didn't think it was important for us to know who actually wrote it. Okay, so don't let that get you down. Don't let that worry you because God is going to speak to us through this amazing book. Some people call it a letter. Others believe it was a, a sermon that was written to Christians and to churches. But let's go ahead and let's jump in right here at the beginning. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 1 and we're going to begin in verse 1. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, I want to go ahead and stop right there because that's something that we've got to make sure that we understand right at the very beginning because he talks about two different times. He said that there was the past and then there was the last days. He says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets. He spoke at different times, and He spoke in different ways. So what is the past? Well, you're probably wondering why I have a manger on stage. You're thinking to yourself, Tim, you've lost it. This is not Christmas. Uh, but really, th this explains the past and last days. Okay, so you need to understand that when you hear the past, it's talking about from creation up until the time Jesus was born. Okay, so when God spoke the world into existence, that's what we consider the past. And it comes all the way up until Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem. And during the past, he spoke through prophets. And he spoke in, in lots of different ways and at lots of different times. I read a book, it's uh, actually a Bible study called Strength for the Journey by a man by the name of Jeff Snell. And this is what he said about how God has communicated in the past and how He communicates now. He said, God demonstrated His communicative creativity prior to the coming of Jesus. Talking about the past. He employed speech, proverbs, prophecy, laws, dreams, visions, guidance through stones, testing, plagues, provisions, symbolic rituals and actions, furniture, and a talking donkey, just to name a few. All of these, however, paled in comparison to his ultimate means of communication, the presence of Jesus on earth. All right, so God used some pretty amazing ways to talk to His people. That's the ancestors that we're talking about, the Jewish people, your ancestors. He talked to them in all of these ways in the past. But, He says, in the last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Okay, from the time Jesus was born until Jesus comes back a second time, God is using the communication of Jesus to speak to us. The words that Jesus said that we see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but also the things that He taught His disciples and He taught the writers of the New Testament. That is how God is going to speak to us today. In the past, it was through prophets, but today it is through His Son. So there's a big difference there, but it all, the, the dividing line is the birth of Jesus. Okay, everybody got it? So God is going to speak through His Son, Jesus. So we're going to talk about Jesus throughout this entire series because that's what the book of Hebrews is about. So we're going to lay this foundation today about Jesus. And we're going to learn through these first four verses that Jesus is greater than everything. All right, that's what we've got to have as our foundation right at the very beginning as we go into this book. Jesus is greater than everything. What is Jesus greater than? Okay, I'm going to make sure you understand that because we're going to go back and study these first four verses because the writer is going to tell us why He is greater than everything else. Now, there's a huge debate that goes on in the world about who Jesus is. There are some of us who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, our Messiah, our Savior. But there are other people that just believe Jesus is a good teacher that he was a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, and, and he had good morals. And so it's good moral things to listen to, but nothing more than that. The, the people in his day, the religious leaders, they believed that he was a blasphemer because of the things that he said. And so there's this huge controversy over who Jesus is. So the world is not going to go, if I say Jesus is greater than everything, the world's not going to go, amen, right on, brother. Then we like, someone will be like, who's Jesus? And then others are going to be like, well, no, nah, he's a good guy, but that's about all he is. But it 
goes so much deeper than that when we jump into this study. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to start back over. Uh, I want us to start over in verse 1. And we're going to read this again. And then we're going to go on through and read all four verses. Verse 1, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days He's spoken to us by His Son whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So He became as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is superior to theirs." Now, you need to understand, in four verses, the Hebrews writer throws it out there. And I mean, he says, let me tell you why Jesus is greater than everything else. I'm going to explain it to you by just talking to you about the characteristics of Jesus, uh, about His personhood. So let's go through and let's talk about those things. First thing he said is He is the heir of all things. You guys know what an heir is, right? It's a person who inherits or is entitled to things that have been left to them, stuff. But not only that, they are entitled to inherit the rank, the title, or the position of another person. In other words, Jesus has all the rights that God has to be worshipped, to be praised, to be listened to. Now, God talked through prophets, and that was awesome. But now He's talking through Jesus, who is the heir of all things. In that book that I quoted from earlier, Jeff Snell, he said the prophets could speak uh, for God, but the Son could speak as God. Y'all see, that's a big difference, right? A prophet can speak for God and say, hey, God told me this and this is what God wants you to know. But the Son comes in, Jesus comes in, and He speaks as God. And so He is the heir of all things, has all the rights that come with being God. Next He says, through Him the universe was made. Now I think this is one of those concepts that we struggle with the most that I really didn't get a hold of until I was an adult, until I'd been in ministry, and I really studied. What we want to do is create Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem. And we want to say that that's when Jesus began to exist. But the Hebrews writer says, no, no, no. Through Him, through Jesus, the entire universe was created. So what I want you all to understand is Jesus became a human being. He became a person when He was born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger. But He existed always. Yeah, mind blown, right? Jesus did not come to existence in this manger. He was there and He helped God form everything. Helped Him create the world and, and to create animals and to create people. He was a part of that creation process. That's how we know that He is God because He was there and He helped create. I want you to see this uh, in, back in, or a little farther down in Hebrews. Would you go down and read with me beginning in verse 8? Okay, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. But about the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. You see that? He called Him God. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, talking about Jesus, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. You see that? That right there tells us that through him, the universe was made. The universe was created. He is God. And he continues by saying, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. See, in the past, back in these days, when the Jews were, were living life and, and worshiping and following God, God appeared to them in different forms. Uh, during the day, He appeared to them as a cloud, a pillar of cloud, and He led them by that. Then at other times, it became fire at night, and He led them that way. When, when He was in the tabernacle, and later when He was in the temple, His presence sometimes came in smoke, uh, or it came in light, and, and He appeared in all of these ways. That showed His glory, but now Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. 
that when Jesus was here on earth, people were looking and able to see God, which again would blow the minds of the Jews because they weren't even allowed to get close to God. And now people are actually living with God. They're living with Jesus. They're eating with Him. They are, they're listening to His teachings because He is the radiance of God's glory. And then He goes on to say He is the exact representation of His being. Okay, Jesus was and is God. Jesus said it about Himself in John 10. He said, I and the Father are one. In John 14, He said, if you have seen Me, you have seen the Father. And so Jesus is the exact representation of God here on earth. A God that people could touch and experience life with. Then he goes on to say, Jesus sustains all things by His powerful Word. He sustains all things by His powerful Word. Now, I am going to show my age here, but in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a stock brokerage firm called E.F. Hutton. And if you ever watch the commercial, there was a young businessman, and he's at a, a table eating with people, and, and, and the conversation goes, somebody asks him, well, who invests your money? Who's your stock broker? And he says, E.F. Hutton. And the whole place stops and looks at him. And then the commercial says, when E.F. Hutton speaks, do you know? People listen. Yeah, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people are going to listen. Listen, I grew up in the house of Tom Hunt. When Tom Hunt spoke, people listened. All right, now, I may not have always done what my father said to do, but I can tell you one thing, I listened to him. My mom might have talked to me and I was like rolling my eyes and that kind of stuff, but not when my dad did because my dad would have smacked my eyes right back in focus, okay? When my dad spoke, I listened. Why? Not because he just said, you will respect me. I'm the authority in this house. He just had that presence about him that I was going to listen to what he had to say. Well, Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. He spoke, and five loaves and two fish fed thousands of people. Jesus spoke, and the blind could see, the deaf could hear, the lame could walk. Jesus spoke, and the dead came back to life. Lazarus, come forth. And a man who had been dead for four days came out of his grave. You see, Jesus sustains everything by his spoken word. Man, Jesus is greater than everything. And He has proven that to us so far. But listen, He doesn't stop there. He continues, and I think this part is one of the best parts. It says that Jesus provided purification for our sins. Jesus came and provided a way for us to have our sins forgiven. Okay, in case you don't know this or in case you've forgotten it, you and I are sinners. And when we sin, that sin separates us from God. It breaks our relationship with Him. And so we have to have that sin issue, that sin problem taken care of. And we couldn't do it ourselves. And so Jesus came and He offered purification for our sins. In the past, the priests, they would work, they would sacrifice animals, but all that did was push their sin forward till the price could be paid. And Jesus came and He offered purification for our sins. In 1 John 1, John says to us, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son purifies us from all sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, you need to understand because Jesus came and was born as a baby, because He lived the perfect life, He died, was raised again, you and I can have our sins taken care of. Not pushed forward until somebody else takes care of it, but our sins are washed away through the blood of Jesus. Man, that ought to get you excited. Okay, you're not looking real excited right now, but you should be excited. Because you are pure. You can be right before God, not because of what you have done or what you will do, but because of what Jesus did. He gave us the purification of sins. And then right along with that, he says, and he is seated at the right hand of God. Now, you may go, okay, big deal. What's the big I didn't think about the big deal until I was studying about this. You know what the big deal is about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God? 
the priest who went before the people, they, they, they stepped between the people and God and said, God, we're going to work on your behalf to make the people as right with you as they can be. Those priests never sat down. They did not have chairs in the tabernacle or the temple. You want to know why they didn't sit down? Because their work was never done. They offered sacrifices day after day after day. They had to make sure that the candles on the lampstands, that they stayed lit. They had to make sure that they offered incense and, and, and that smell was represented the prayers of God's people and it was an aroma that was pleasing to God. They had bread that had to be changed in and out so that it was fresh. The priests never sat down because the work of making people right with God was never finished. Are you, are you feeling me yet? You understand where I'm going with this? Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. You know why he's sitting down? Because he's done. Because Jesus has done everything that you and I need. He paid the ultimate price. He was perfect. And so he died so that you and I could be forgiven. That's a big deal, family. Jesus is not up there going, okay, God, what do I need to do next? Okay, God, what is it? I've got to take care of their sins. He's already done that. And Jesus is just sitting waiting. Going, all right, Dad, when you're ready, tell me, I'll go get them. All right, God, when, when, when people have heard, when your message is out there and you're ready to bring your children home, you give me the signal and I'm there. He says he is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Seated at the right hand of God because Jesus finished the work. Can I get an amen on that? Y'all aren't convinced. That's all right. Hebrews is going to convince you as we go through this study, all right? And then there's one last thing that he says to help us realize that Jesus is greater than everything. It says he is superior to the angels. Okay, now we live in a culture that loves to worship angels, right? I'm sorry, but we got them everywhere. Go in any Christian bookstore and there are angels and, and we have angels in our houses and there's nothing right wrong with that. Angels are pretty awesome. You know, when people experienced angels in Scripture, they fell down and worshiped. They were scared because they were powerful beings. But he says he, he is superior to the angels. The angels might be great, but they're nothing compared to Jesus. You know, we have TV shows. Uh, what do we, we had Touched by an Angel, if y'all remember that. Had Highway to Heaven. And so there is this tendency sometimes for people to worship angels. We don't worship angels. We worship Jesus Christ. We worship God Almighty. Now let me show you that. Look back in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5. This shows you how Jesus is greater. It says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? Today I become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when did God, or excuse me, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And he goes even farther and says, The name that Jesus was given was the greatest name. Angels don't even compare to the name that was given. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' name is so powerful, there is going to come a day that you and I will bow before him. And the only question is going to be, are you going to bow willingly or are you going to bow because you have to? I don't know about you, but I plan on bowing willingly and saying, man, come Lord Jesus, come. I am so glad that you are here. Listen, Jesus, even His name is more powerful than angels. So the Hebrews writer, he takes the first four verses in that first chapter to just make sure that you and I understand that Jesus is greater than everything. Whether it was created, whether it was a person, it doesn't matter. Jesus is greater than everything. And that's why He deserves our worship and our praise. That's why you and I can trust Him with our lives. Because He provided purification for our sins. He took our punishment on Himself so that we could stand before God as one of His children. Man, there is nothing greater than Jesus. And so we're laying the groundwork. Here it is. The groundwork is there. And the rest of this book that we're going to dig into is going to talk about even more. Why is Jesus greater? Why is it that Jesus understands our struggles in 2017? And we will find that out in just a couple of weeks.
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. And family, I believe that God is speaking today. I pray that He is not speaking through me near as much as He is speaking through His Word. In fact, I prayed a prayer this morning that I plan on praying every time I preach as I go through this series. And it simply says, God, never let me speak louder than Your Word. God, never let me speak louder than Your Word. And I mean that in my preaching and in my teaching. I want to make sure you hear my opinions this much and you hear God's Word that much. But it goes for you as well. Because we speak for God. As His children, we speak for Him. People watch how we live our lives. They watch how we talk to other people and how we treat other people. Especially people who are different than us. Especially people who believe differently than us. And we're speaking on behalf of God. And we need to watch how we speak. Listen, Jesus is greater than everything. And I want you to know that. The Hebrews writer wanted you to know that. Because if you will build your life on Him, you will be pleasing to God. And I believe one day you'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your Father's happiness. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for taking care of a problem that we could not take care of ourselves. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to, to purify us, to give us a way back to you, to give us an opportunity to have our relationship with you restored. God, we can never thank you enough, but I pray that we thank you by the way we live our lives and by the way we speak. God, may we never speak louder than your word. May we understand that Jesus is greater than everything. We love you, Father, and we pray this prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man, are you guys excited about this study? Hmm. I am. Because I think God is going to get in there and He's going to dig. And it's not going to be comfortable all the time. Because He's going to talk about things that are going to make us think, hmm, I need to think about my life. I need to think about how I'm living. I need to think about where I'm putting my confidence. So I hope you're ready for God to speak to you into that in this series. And I believe that God is speaking right now. But here's what I don't know. I don't know what God is saying to you. I know I said that the big idea is Jesus is greater than everything. But I believe God is speaking to you personally right now in this moment. And for some of you, I think He's saying to you, please come home. Would you please stop running from me? Would you give your life to me? I want to have a relationship. I want to call you my child. That's why I let Jesus die for you. Will you accept His his gift? If you believe that Jesus is God's Son, God in the flesh, if you're willing to repent of your sins and confess His name, you can be baptized into Christ. And listen, that water has no magical powers. It just symbolizes the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, who speaks to us speaks to our heart so we hear God's message for us. If God is speaking to that you, to you today, why are you waiting? Would you make that decision? Listen, maybe you're here and God's just speaking to you about your life, about the things you're saying, about the way you're living. You're a Christian, you've accepted Jesus, but you're just having a tough time right now. You need to remember again that Jesus is everything. You need to give Him your everything. So you can do that right there where you are. Maybe you want to come forward because you want some accountability, some people to help you through this journey together. Man, we would, we would love to, to have you come and, and we'll pray for you. But maybe your prayer has to do with something else. Maybe there's a physical battle in your life. Maybe there's a spiritual battle. Maybe there's a financial difficulty. or I don't know what may be going on, but if you want us to pray about that, we would love to do that. 
There will be elders up here in the front and they'll pray with you privately. They love to do that. But if you want all of us to pray, you tell us what's going on and, and we will literally surround you with this church family and we'll ask God's will to be done in your life. But maybe God's speaking to you and he's saying, you know what? It's time to quit just coming and sitting in a pew. It's time for you to commit to being a part of this church family. It's time for you to come and say, I want to place my membership with the Checkers Christian Church. And if you want to do that, listen, we're here to connect to God, grow in faith, and live to serve. And if you're ready to be a part of that, we will welcome you. So over the next few minutes, as we sing and we worship together, you're going to have an opportunity to make that kind of decision. But not only that, to be prayed for, or to accept Christ, or, or to be a part of this church, but you're also going to have an opportunity to remember what Jesus did. To remember that death that he died. The death that made him greater than everything. The way we do that is we have a station in the front, two on the sides, and we have four in the back. And you just come up any time during this worship over the next three songs. And you can take communion right there where you are. And if you do, I encourage you to throw your used cup in the basket or in the garbage cans under the stations. But you may want to take the bread and the juice back to your seat so you can just say, Jesus, thank you for your body. Jesus, thank you for your blood. And have some time with, with God. However that works for you, you do it that way. So you can come for prayer. You can come for the Lord's Supper. You can come and give. We have offering plates up here. We have offering plates in the back. And, and you can give. That's a way that we worship. It's because we give. And when we give, we support Christ Church of Virginia Tech. And I believe there are young people that are going to impact our world because of that ministry at Virginia Tech. So giving is a form of worship. But right now, this time is not about the person next to you, in front of you, or behind you. This time is about you and God and what God is speaking to you. So let's worship together. You have decisions, whatever. We'll be right over here at the side. We're going to sing right now. And we're going to worship our God.